Thank you. Good evening, New York. Good evening, uh, beautiful McDowell community. My name is Faraz Drake. I'm a Palestinian composer and uh, kanun player. It's a great pl pleasure and honor to be invited to perform at this lovely evening. Um, this is a kanun. For those of you who don't know, it's the Mediterranean harp. It's uh, common in Arabic music, Armenian music, Turkish, and Greek music. And uh, one of my big goals as a composer is all, was always to stretch and break the limits of this instrument and introduce it to new audiences and new realms of music. Um, I was at McDowell earlier this year, in April and May. I had a wonderful time there. I wrote lots of new music. I reconnected myself. I won the ping pong tournament. Uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. Um, I just want to say one thing in regards to, to this evening. Pablo Picasso once said that the art washes away your soul from the dust of everyday life. And that's precisely what McDowell did to me and does to every artist and fellow. And if you think about it, if the consumers of the art and lovers of cinema and film and poetry and literature and music need art as a refuge, then artists need the creation of art as their refuge. And that's precisely what McDowell does. So I want to encourage everyone tonight to support whatever you can, because I, I personally believe that investing in the arts is the best investment of humanity. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Faraz. That was incredible. Um, and we are so glad you can be here with us tonight. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sharon Washington. And uh, <laughs> hold the applause. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I am thrilled to be your host for the evening. And I promise you we'll hear more wonderful music from McDowell Fellows throughout the program. And we'll also learn about Fellows' experiences at the creative oasis that is McDowell, a place where creativity, imagination, and free expression is supported, encouraged, and inspired on a daily basis. It's a place and an idea that exists because people who love art understand that it takes time and effort for beauty to be created before it can be enjoyed by the wider public. Okay, now I'd like to take you on a journey to another world, a world where imagination and creativity are not valued. Imagine a world without art, a world without art not easy, right? Or a world where only certain people get to determine what art actually is, or what passes as art. Well, we're here today to make sure that never happens. Because we know that to have a vibrant culture, one where there are no restrictions on someone's imagination, we need artists of all types. And we know that creating conditions that enable and encourage them is incredibly important. So I grew up here in New York City where my father was the custodian in the New York Public Library system. So back in the day, custodial families lived in apartments inside many libraries around the city. So as a child, I lived in the St. Agnes branch of the New York Public Library on 81st in Amsterdam. My father's job as custodian was hard, cleaning three floors of that building, and most importantly, keeping the coal furnace stoked 24-7. Now, I wrote about those experiences and performed them in my solo show, Feeding the Dragon. So when I think back to the worlds I was transported to as a child. When my father would let me roam the halls of the library after dark, after closing, 
and how all those stories and all those books lit up my imagination in ways I am still exploring as an artist working today. The different worlds I encountered in those rooms in that library through words and pictures and music helped me understand that there was a big world out there and that we're all actually not that different from each other. And that sharing our art and our stories humanizes and personalizes our shared experiences. Art can be a place of first contact. That's why I'm here tonight. That's why we're here tonight. I've been a fan of McDowell for its leadership in giving artists the freedom to create for forever. It gives artists the freedom to tell their stories. Working in all disciplines, time, space, feeds them three meals a day, and as an actor, let me tell you, <laughs> meals are very important to artists. And I hear they're pretty incredible meals. <laughs> Artists don't pay to go to McDowell. It's primarily funded by individual donors, foundations, and corporate sponsors, like those seated next to you. That's why you're here tonight, and why we're asking you to be generous in giving to this important cause, this vital cause, so that the creators of our cultural story can continue their work. Now, I'd like to introduce one of McDowell's newest board members and a co-chair of the National Benefit Committee, a fellow native New Yorker and thespian. Please welcome to the stage, Katie Firth. Good evening. I'm so delighted to welcome you all here this evening. This is a wonderful time to be joining the stewardship of McDowell, among whom you will find several new faces. Later tonight, you'll meet our terrific new executive director, Chi Caetano. And I also want to recognize the invigorated, focused, and energizing leadership of the fabulous Christine Fisher, whom we are proud and fortunate to have as our new board president. Christine, thank you for everything you have done and are doing for the McDowell community. As Sharon said, I am a new board member, but my family's association with McDowell goes back three generations to my grandmother, Valley Firth, who was introduced to, the McD to McDowell and became a trustee in the 1970s. My father often says the McDowell made her life. And when I first shared that with Chi, she said, you're the third person who said that to me today. <laughs> and you're gonna hear that again and again from the fellows at your tables tonight. As a child, I misunderstood the ways in which my grandmother's life was made by McDowell. <clears throat> she was a painter, but not Contrary to my mistaken early beliefs, she wasn't a fellow. McDowell made her life because she found there, and by there, I of course mean here, she found a community dedicated to the creative mind. McDowell is a location, but it's also an idea. Edward and Marion McDowell's Peterborough idea conceived a creative sanctuary. 450 acres in New Hampshire, where writers and composers, painters and poets, journalists and choreographers could cross-pollinate, regenerate, flourish, hibernate if necessary, and dream. McDowell is a dreamy, alchemical place. The leadership and staff of McDowell love their work because it's a privilege to welcome 300 extraordinary artists every year to spend two to six weeks in one of 31 studios, giving them a room of their own to do what only they can do. And I think the fellows here tonight 
will tell you that they consider it a privilege to be invited to McDowell, to gather nightly for dinner at the same table where James Baldwin, Willa Cather, Leonard Bernstein, Faith Ringgold, and so many others unwound after a day of work. Emerging or established, McDowell artists have been contributing to the culture in extraordinary ways for over a century recognized with countless Guggenheims, Obies, Grammys, Rome Prizes, Tonys, Academy Awards, National Medals in the Arts, and over 100 Pulitzers. These accolades are astounding, but I don't think they are what bring our fellows to Peterborough, nor us here tonight. These are complicated, uncertain, and grief-stricken times and the cacophony of public discourse could not be more at odds with the Peterborough idea of freedom to create. Consequently, our mission at McDowell seems commensurately uncomplicated, certain, and urgent. It is artists who will lead us back to each other, help us hear, heal our sorrows and contradictions, teach us new languages, imagine new solutions, as it has always been. Artists will show us how to make our lives with compassion and empathy. Standing here this evening, I know what my grandmother knew. To play any part in this essential work, the privilege is ours. Thank you all so much for joining us in this endeavor. <laughs> it's now my delight to introduce another fellow, James Brandon Lewis. Thank you for being here, James. Would you mind sharing with us a little bit about your experience at McDowell? Well, it was a time needed, for sure. <laughs> I spent about five weeks there um, in April from March I think mid-March to about April. I was there for five weeks, 2022. I was able to work on two albums, um, one that'll be forthcoming called Transfiguration with my quartet. And then the recent one is a album dedicated to Mahalia Jackson called For Mahalia With Love. Um, and it was, it was a beautiful experience, you know, to wake up in the morning, have the grand piano there, be able to have my saxophone there, you know, quiet out the noise from New York. It was really needed. And so, um, so yeah, I'll play an ep excerpt tonight featuring um, Kurt Knufke on cornet. And, um, yeah, it's an excerpt for, right now, for Mahalia with Love. It, it's entitled Sparrow. It mixes original composition that I wrote and then His Eyes on a Sparrow. Thank, Thank you. you.
Hello, beautiful people. Thank you so much, James, and thank you, Kirk. I thought that was incredible. What a privilege it is to be executive director of McDowell. I see being an executive director as having three core jobs. Firstly, build a compelling vision and mission for an organization and align your community around that big idea. Second, ask people for money <laughs> to support the mission and vision. And third, tell a story so powerful, so appealing, so resonant, that people will not only join you on the journey, but they'll bring others along, and together you'll build something like a movement, a community of all different kinds of people united around the same mission. I could spend my time up here talking about why art matters, and it does more than I can say, but what I am really here to tell you about is why McDowell matters, and why McDowell matters right now. The world can be a capricious and uncertain place, and events of the last week have shown us this. I was born in a country that no longer exists, Rhodesia. It's now known as Zimbabwe. And this was during a brutal 15-year civil war. My childhood years were spent in a country in recovery from conflict and with a people that were utterly, utterly traumatized. I remember being maybe five or six years old and being taught which open fields to avoid on the walk to school because you didn't want to lose a limb stepping on a landmine. I was taught what a grenade looked like and what an emergency siren sounded like. These are true stories. The late, great Kenyan novelist and memoirist, Binyavanga Wainana, once wrote a book about his African childhood called, One Day I'll Write About This Place and maybe one day I'll write about my African childhood. But I bring this up because that period of turmoil and what came after produced some of the greatest literature, the greatest poetry, the greatest visual art, the greatest music that my birth country had ever seen. Each of us was using art to try and interpret and understand and process the times we had lived through and the times that were to come. We were using art to knit our communities back together. McDowell has welcomed artists of all kinds from all over the country and all over the world for over a century. McDowell built the artist's sanctuary model starting in 1907. But we know the world churns, and through it all, we have a constant. Art, which helps us investigate and comprehend who we are, how we live, and how we want to live. McDowell is at the very heart of this. Art, artists, and community are made at McDowell. The world can be full of suffering, but it is also capable of great beauty. Look around you. I am so, so proud to be part of a community that brings people from everywhere together. Thank you. Hope you're having a good time. Tonight, we are awarding the fourth annual Marion McDowell Arts Advocacy Award. An honor that McDowell offers to those who profoundly and uniquely support artists. It's named after Marion McDowell, who inherited the McDowell program after the death of her husband when the program was only a year old. But she had a vision for it. For the next 40 years, she worked tirelessly, touring the country, spreading the word, developing relationships with funders and artists to establish the most preeminent residency program in the country. Marion's greatest mission was to create a residency that existed, in her own words, without regard to social position. Tonight, we honor another towering figure in the lives of many artists, 
To help us learn more about our honoree tonight, I'd like to introduce our presentation speaker, Adam Pendleton. You may have seen Adam's work around the corner in a little place called the Museum of Modern Art. His last installation filled the museum's atrium with graphics, text, and video in a tour de force show. His work has been shown in solo exhibits the world over, including the Whitney Biennial and the Venice Biennale. He's known tonight's honoree for much of his career, but, well, I'll let him tell you about that. As he presents the Marion McDowell Arts Advocacy Award, please welcome Adam Pendleton. Thank you so much, Sharon. I'm delighted to be here tonight to present Fairfax Dorn with the Marion McDowell the fourth annual Mary McDowell Arts Advocacy Award. So I encourage everyone who doesn't know much about Fairfax to read the program, because I'm not gonna read the bio, the notes. Um, and as Sharon said, Fairfax is a towering figure in the lives of many artists and certainly Yes. <laughs> and certainly has been a towering figure in my life as an artist and also as a friend. So I'd like to share some notes that I wrote tonight to honor Fairfax. What are the chances that I would sit down to write my remarks planning to begin them with a question I remembered from a poem by the late American poet Jane Kenyon, only to discover she wrote the poem at, Mad at McDowell, and it's even titled Afternoon at McDowell. <laughs> literally, that's literally. It, what are the chances? What are the chances that after nearly 20 years of friendship, I'd have the great privilege to be here tonight to pay tribute and to honor Fairfax Dorn? In the case of Fairfax, quite high as she makes friendship not only possible, but generative, necessary, and sustaining. I have not met many, if any, like Fairfax. Her spirit, her humble and clear sense of generosity, her commitment to art and those who create it. Some of my favorite places in the world are those created by Fairfax. She is able to transform space, to create a sense of mutual belonging gracious comfort, ease, and grace. In short, a reflection of who she is. Some part of us chooses who we are, who we are going to be, how we are going to regard, how we are going to treat each other, what and who we are going to be committed to, what and who we are going to open ourselves to, and of course, what and who we are going to love. To show kindness in moments when it may not seem necessary. To stand up for someone or something when no one will see you standing to give someone something, an idea, a chance, when it could just as easily be ignored. This is the character of Fairfax Dorn. So what was that question that Jane Kenyon wrote at McDowell? Here it is. I believe in the miracles of art, but what prodigy will keep you safe beside me? It's an imposing question, and one will only begin to be able to answer in 
regards to art if we continue to create it. Art requires dedication, foolishness, chaos, quiet, and an abundance of beautiful noise. And also clarity of purpose, clarity of vision, and a resounding faith in our humanistic potential. McDowell makes these pursuits possible. Fairfax, you make these pursuits possible. Let us honor these pursuits and the gift of each other. Let us honor my dear friend, Fairfax Dorn. Um, remarkable and so, so touching, Adam. Thank you. I'm so humbled. God, I give you a little background on Adam and where we came, where we, where, how we connected. Um, when Virginia and I invited Adam Pendleton to be a part of one of our first major exhibition, Optimo, in 2004, he took a leap into the unknown making something completely interactive. He had CD Walkmans attached to the walls. Yes, the CD Walkmans with the headphones. Through the headphones, he asked simple questions. How do you feel today? What color is the sky? He asked the listeners to write their answers on the wall. At the end of the exhibition, after many months, on the brightly yellow painted walls, it was graffiti with so many emotions and answers, head to toe. The piece was the very beginning of Adam's incredible artistic path. The same with Jonah Freeman and his epic art installation, Hello Meth Lab in the Sun. The, Sun. the same with Matthew Day Jackson or Liz Cohen and Aaron Scherer's Ash Sculptures and Will Villalongo and his magnificent stained glass window and showing Michael Amarada's films through Joss Siegel at Ballroom was all incredibly special and with along with many more amazing minds and talents. But we have a long way to go as we have only worked with about 900 artists, whereas McDowell has engaged with 8,000 artists, which is astonishing. Mary McDowell was a true visionary beyond her time 120 years ago. Like McDowell, Ballroom Marfa was simply an experiment, experiment, an idea only created 20 years ago. Giving artists space to take risks, giving artists time to make, giving artists freedom to create and to explore their vision is paramount to ensure we treasure, honor, and interpret the evolution of our complex humanity. Tremendous gratitude goes out to Christine Fisher, Josh Siegel, David Macy, Amy Sorkin, and the rest of the McDowell board. What an extraordinary group of people. Thank you for believing in me and Ballroom Marfa. Loved my visit to Peterborough this summer for Metal Day. Everyone here needs to experience that community of such a beautiful place that exists within the sacred forest of creativity. Thank you for sharing Washington and all the incredible musicians tonight for making it so special. And most of all, thank you to Chi. You are the future of McDowell. And it's a true honor to be with here with you tonight and everyone. It's a great privilege to, see, to receive this award in the esteemed footsteps of Ava DeVernay, Mahogany L. Brown, and Susan Uttenberg. Though I would not be standing here tonight without Ballroom's co-founder, an incredible visionary, and my best friend in life, Virginia Leverman. Virginia, I share this award and honor with you, flowers from a rock, fearless dreamers. More peace is critically needed in this world. I ask that we all take moments in our days to pray for peace and more understanding. Thank you so much.
Well. Thank you, Adam, and thank you, Fairfax, for all the work you do supporting the arts and artists. Wow, this room is filled with such incredible artists and performers. It's kind of buzzing, so. Uh, we have a final performance tonight from more McDowell Fellows. Please welcome Daniel and Patrick Lazour. Okay, so I'm, so I'm supposed to throw you questions sure, while sure, you're we're setting ready. up, right? Okay, so, hi Daniel, hi Patrick. Hey there. Hey. <laughs> I hear you wrote a musical while you were at McDowell. We did, in fact, yeah. Would you mind telling us a little bit about it, or sure. perhaps a favorite story, or a memory, or? But of course, yeah. <laughs> Thank I'm you, Sharon. Sure. Um, we wrote our musical, We Live in Cairo, uh, at McDowell, which is about um, the Egyptian Revolution in 2011 the youth movement. Um, it, was a, it was an amazing time for us because we were actually, it was 2018, right, Danielle? Mm -hmm. And we were going into our first ever production of a show uh, the next year. So we were preparing, we were all a buzz preparing for this show to happen the next year. So we were writing drafts and we wrote like what, three song, three new songs, three new songs. Yeah. for the show? Yeah, yeah I remember wow. we were in the library and we made like a word cloud of lyrics and we're like, could yeah. we make this into a song? And, and like, it became the first song. Yeah, it became yeah. the first song. Yeah. We're not gonna be singing that one. But. <laughs> I will say I also almost burned down my cabin one night. Um, I like, was try it was in the middle of winter and I was trying to get the, you know, get the thing started. Get the thing and, started. Yeah, right. And I fell asleep and mm -hmm. at 3 a.m. the fire was blazing in the, it was horrifying. It, I mean, beautiful and horrifying, you know, much like our times. The name of your new song. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and um, I'll also say, you know, that was like McDowell, when we went to McDowell, it was one of our first artist residencies. And it was, we didn't know this then, yeah. We didn't know this then, but it was a really special alchemy of people there. Yeah. Um, you, you, like just going to other residencies and sometimes like it just doesn't quite gel it's a, or it's a different thing, it's much more solitary. But th this crew, it was like very musical. We would like eat, yes. we'd gather around the piano, we'd sing, it was great. It was a great, great vibe. Cool. And with cool. that. And with that. <laughs> and now. Thank you so much, thank you. This, this song is actually from, from the show We Live in Cairo. This is the end of act one. It's called Tech. I'm a son of Tahir, born into hope, into heat, into thousands of voices. I'm a son of Tahir, out in the crowd, on the street, our pain, our pride, our choices. We've been chanting Horea, Horea, we've been singing for days. Now is here. We'll wait an hour, a day, a month, a year. We have cracked the wall of fear, and we'll see it crumble. our own, waiting for morning to fight against the worst of it. Imagine freedom, Horea, Horea.
grumbled Oh Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you. having Thank us, you, everyone. Thank, Thank you so much. Now I'd like to introduce you to our closing speaker, who has a very unique experience with McDowell. She was a fellow in 2014 and 2017, and also became a McDowell board member this year. She's the author of the novel, You Are One of Them, a New York Times editor's choice and finalist for the National Book Critics Circle's John Leonard Award for a first book. She's deputy editor of the Yale Review. Please welcome Elliot Holt. Thank you, Sharon. Can all of you hear me? Thank you to the wonderful Lazor brothers. This is a very tough act to follow, especially because I'm not going to sing. I could, but I don't think you want to hear that. Um, as Sharon said, I'm Elliot Holt, and I am very proud to be a McDowell Fellow. Because as Chi said earlier, it's not just art that is made at McDowell. I would argue that artists are made there as well. My first fellowship in 2014 was a life-changing experience. I will never forget my first night at McDowell. I found myself seated at dinner next to Michael Shabon. Are you here, Michael? Maybe. Pulitzer Prize winner, all around brilliant writer. I had been reading his work for a decade and I couldn't believe that I was sitting next to him, but more importantly, I couldn't believe that I was being treated as a peer. Because one of the things that's really extraordinary about McDowell is that at whatever stage you are in your career, you're equal. Because McDowell reminds you that being an artist is not about the work you've already made, it's about the process, the ongoing process of creating work. It's a place where you are free to take risks and try new things. It's a place where artists find new ideas and projects get unstuck. For me, being in community with talented people like the late great writer Paul Lafarge, Yes, I think we should give him a round of applause because he was, I believe, a six-time McDowell Fellow and um, the filmmaker Jessica Oreck, the composer Ted Hearn, the visual artist Jesse Herod, the poet John Murillo. These are just some of the wonderful people that I got to meet when I was there. Being in community with those people helped me trust the process of showing up every day in my studio to work. I wasn't just writing at McDowell, I was coming into my own. McDowell gave me faith in myself and my process and everything I write even now, years later after my second fellowship, owes something to that gift. I know that many other fellows feel the same way, and so I'd like to ask every McDowell Fellow in attendance tonight to stand so that we can all take a moment, look at these beautiful, beautiful faces. Mm. 
let's take a moment to acknowledge the people. <laughs> let's take a moment to acknowledge the people who have been inspired by, and yes, in some sense, made at McDowell. Um, thank you all. And Sharon, I think I'm supposed to pass it back to you now. <laughs> back to me? Back to you, Sharon. Oh, back to me. That was my applause because I was in the back and I didn't see the fellow stand up. So. <laughs> so thank you everyone for joining us this evening. As you leave, you'll pass by a mini McDowell gift library. And by now you all know how much I love anything with the word library. And, um, this one's extra special featuring books by McDowell Fellows, which were kindly donated by their publishers. Please feel free to take one with you. We're, th we're very grateful for your support both tonight and in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again for joining us. Enjoy dessert. <laughs>